Welcome to the organic management session of the Moses Virtual Field Day on Kernza. My name is Jake Youngers, and I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Agronomy and Plant Genetics. During this chapter of the Moses Field Day on Kernza, we're going to talk about a few topics related to organic management of Kernza. First, we're going to talk about how Kernza can be used as an organic transition crop, some of the benefits and challenges related to using this species during that transition period from conventional to organic management. Then we're going to cover some strategies for weed control, talk a little bit about fertilization, specifically about nitrogen fertilization. Then we're going to cover some topics on harvest timing and techniques. So first we're going to talk about how Kernza can be used as a crop during that organic transition period. Benefits to using Kernza is that it's a low input species. It requires less nitrogen fertilizer than most other small grain crops. It also requires fewer passes in the field for tillage. Uh, during that transition period, a grower would not have to do any tillage from the time of planting Kernza to termination. And this is really helpful for improving soil health. Another advantage to using Kernza as an organic transition crop is that the seeds are relatively high value. That grain is high value even when it's not certified organic. Grain harvested from plants grown during this transition period have received a price premium. Now that's not going to be guaranteed in the future, but at this time we know that there is demand for kerns of grain that is produced organically even though it's not certified organic. Colin and Connie will talk more about this in the other chapters related to this field day. Let's talk a little bit about the logistics of how Kernza can be used during this organic transition period. Kernza is planted in late summer, early fall. We like to see Kernza get in the ground uh, before September. Sometime between August and September seems to be like a pretty good timeline for the upper Midwest. So the Kernza is planted, let's say mid-August. The first harvest is just about a year later. Kernza can then be harvested again in August of the second year, which would be initiating the third year of the transition period. One situation or one scenario could be to terminate Kernza after the second harvest, sometime in the late fall or early winter. The spring following termination the first organically certified crop could be planted. And in this scenario, for example, we're looking at soybean. Soybean would then be planted in the spring and harvested in October, which is after the third year since the transition period started. Thus, the soybeans could be marketed and sold organically. Now let's talk a little bit about establishment and weed control. One strategy for managing weeds is to control the kerns of plant population. Kerns can be established in either narrow rows or with wide rows. And this can be thought of as a high planting density or a lower planting density. When I refer to narrow rows, I'm talking about row spacings around 6 to 12 inches. Wider rows can be anything between 15 to 30 inches and in some cases even wider. So let's discuss some of the pros and cons to both of these strategies. With narrow rows, we often see lower weed pressure. Because there's more kerns of plants in the field, there's more competition with those weeds. So this is a natural organic way to manage weed pressure. We all often also see higher grain yields in the first year with the narrower rows. On the other hand, we see a quicker yield decline as the stands age with the narrow rows. We've also noticed at multiple locations that the plant height is greater in narrower rows because the plants are competing more for the light. 
which makes that stand more vulnerable to lodging. If we consider the pros and cons to the wide rows, uh, wide rows are good for growers who have the tools and techniques to cultivate between rows for mechanical weed control. So I have this as a pro and a con because not all growers have those tools and techniques, especially during the transition period. Wider rows uh, seem to have a higher yield over a longer duration of the stand life. This varies from field to field. Uh, and we're learning that some of that variability is related to the background fertility. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a little bit. Wider rows also seem to have shorter plants, meaning that the stands are less vulnerable to lodging. A drawback to the wider rows is that we've observed lower first year yields. I'm just going to show you some very simple bar graphs here. Uh, we're looking at grain yield turns a grain yield on the y-axis and each bar represents plots harvested uh, from stands at different row spacings 6, 12, and 24 inches. So here we do indeed see in the first year that grain yields were higher in the 6 inch rows compared to 12 and 24. No differences between the 12 and 24 inch row spacing. This study took place at St. Paul and we observed a pretty dramatic yield decline in the second year. This is also an agronomic issue related to currency production that we'll talk more about. Uh, but the year when that yield decline occurs varies quite a bit from location to location. We're doing a lot of research right now to understand why that's occurring and what drives uh, that those differences in which year the yield decline begins. So here in St. Paul we saw a yield decline in the second year, but by this time we did not see any differences in row spacing. In the third year we saw a little bit of an increase in yields with some of these row spacings, specifically the 12 inch row spacing compared to the narrow row spacing. And by year four we saw uh, the yields again pretty low uh, and at this stage a grower may have to consider terminating and rotating that field into a new crop. Now I'm going to show you some photographs of stands. This is actually one stand in Rosemount, Minnesota. This is a stand that was planted rather late. Uh, it was mid-September in 2018, less than ideal planting date. Uh, and this photo was taken May 19th 2019 so the first spring after planting and this field was planted in 18 inch row spacing uh, at a seeding rate of five pounds per acre which is also a little bit lower than uh, what we would see in a narrower row spacing full disclosure is that this plot was managed conventionally so the low weed pressure uh, may be due to the herbicides that were used in the fall after establishment now here's that exact same field in July 26, 2019. So that first year of grain harvest. It's a very lush field, lots of seed heads, it yielded about 500 pounds per acre uh, in the combine. So I'm showing you these two pictures to demonstrate that even though a field looks pretty wimpy and weak in that first spring after establishment, it can indeed recover and produce vi economically viable grain yields the first year. Not just economically viable, but perhaps some of the best grain yields the grower might see during the three-year lifespan of that field. Here's the same field again, and now uh, this is in April 20th of 2020, so earlier this spring. And what I want to show you here is that there is uh, some green growth in between rows so we're seeing some recruitment in between these rows uh, which is something that might uh, lead to the changes in grain yield with stand age and here is that same field again this year not too long ago this photo was taken in 
uh, June 18th, uh, the plants are heading and we can see that this is still a very lush field, no lodging yet, um, and we can still identify the rows because of that uh, wider row spacing to begin with. Another topic we're going to discuss today is nutrient management, specifically nitrogen. From the research here at the University of Minnesota, we found that the agronomically optimum nitrogen fertilizer rates range somewhere between 60 and 100 pounds of nitrogen per acre. This of course varies by soil type, by climate, and by stand age. One way to provide nitrogen to these kinds of fields in an organic production system is through legume intercropping. Planting legumes in between rows of kernza, also called intercropping, is a really sustainable way to provide nitrogen to the system to increase kernza grain yields. Legumes fix nitrogen from the atmosphere and make that available through uh, decomposing tissues as well as through exudates. Nitrogen can also be transferred from legumes to kernza through mycorrhizal fungi. There are a number of different ways and configurations for intercropping legumes into Kernza stands. We he see here a few photos of different configurations and different legume species. At the University of Minnesota, we've tested a large number of legume species for suitability with intercropping with Kernza. Legume species such as white clover, red clover, alfalfa, bird's foot trefoil, Canada milk vetch, Illinois bundle flower, and even species like sainfoin. Currently we're working with the University of Wisconsin and the Land Institute on a SARE grant to test different legume species for intercropping with Kernza in partnership with growers. Manures can also be used to provide nitrogen to the Kernza crop. Composted livestock manure is one option swine manure, as well as commercial pelleted products, often found uh, or made from poultry manure. Manures make for a good nitrogen fertilizer source because they are made up of both organic and inorganic nitrogen. And the organic nitrogen can decay throughout the growing season, which makes nitrogen available to the plant uh, at different times of the year throughout the growing season as opposed to just one shot of inorganic nitrogen uh, that many fields typically receive uh, with a conventional fertilizer. The last topic we're going to discuss today in terms of organic Kernza management is harvest. And there are two ways to harvest Kernza. The first is to directly combine grain from the standing plants. The second is to swath Kernza into windrows and harvest grain from those windrows. Before a producer can decide on which method to use, the producer needs to understand some of the physiological differences in Kernza compared to other small grain crops. One unique attribute of Kernza is that seeds mature from the top of the spike down to the bottom of the spike in that order. So first we should talk a little bit about the anatomy of the spike. Seeds are found within an individual floret and those florets are clustered within spikelets. Then there are multiple spikelets along a Kernza seed head or a spike. And we often see anywhere between six and eight individual seeds or florets within each spikelet and anywhere between 16 and 24 spikelets per spike. The seeds at the top of the spike, they mature first. So they dry down before those on the lower or on the base of the spike. So by the time that the seeds at the bottom of the spike are dry down and ready to harvest, we start to see some shattering of the spikelets and florets from the top of the seed head. Mm -hmm. 
So one way to prevent shattering is to swath a stand uh, early on in, during physiological maturity uh, and one can start any time that the seeds at the base of the spike, those that are the slowest to mature, when those reach around 40% moisture content, that means many of the seeds in the middle and at the top are easily between 30 and 35% moisture. Now depending on the conditions, grain can be ready to combine within two days after swathing. And if the grain, if the seeds are exposed to uh, unwelcoming conditions such as rain and cool weather, the seeds can actually start to germinate while still in the spikes. And we've recorded this germination occurring after about 10 days within a wind, wind row uh, and after some rain events on the wind row. Direct combining or straight cutting is an alternative to swathing. The challenge here is that the grain needs to be at a certain low moisture content because all of that grain is then going to go into the combine right away. Uh, which means that if a grower is going to have to wait for that grain to be dry enough to direct combine, we're probably going to be experiencing shattering. A visual indicator to when to start harvesting if a grower is going to be direct combining is to look for when the spike curls and Carmen will talk a little bit more about that in his presentation. Carmen will probably also talk about uh, the use of a stripper header which has worked well for currents of harvest in western Minnesota. Be sure to adjust your combine settings appropriately for small seed this can vary from machine to machine. Uh, it's good to reach out to some of the other Kernza growers who have experience harvesting Kernza with different types of combines to get some information on what those combine settings should be. And we are working with the Land Institute to consolidate a lot of this information uh, for re growers to reference when they take on Kernza production. After the kerns is harvested, especially when direct combined, and most so to review the different harvest techniques, there are some advantages and disadvantages of swathing. Advantages include flexibility and timing. A grower can swath earlier in the season, and there is some flexibility in that timing of the swathing. Grain may not may not require much mechanical drying after being swathed if it the conditions were really good for drying during the time that it was in a windrow. Often growers experience fewer weed seed issues after windrowing compared to direct combining. One thing to be careful of is precipitation or cool moist conditions during the dry down period after swathing and before combining. Another disadvantage to this system is that it requires more tractor passes and equipment. Which leads me to the advantages for direct combining, fewer tractor passes and less equipment. Generally requires less time in the tractor uh, to accomplish the harvest. Some disadvantages of direct combining include wetter grain. Growers have noted that the harvest requires typically more conditioning to clean weed seeds out and it can also result in more shattering. So I want to acknowledge a very large group of researchers who work on all of these topics uh, from the University of Minnesota, from the Sustainable Agroecology Lab here at the U, many graduate students, postdocs, and staff scientists who invested a lot of time and energy into compiling this information and doing these experience experiments and of course the farmer partners who are so critical for doing this research. So I want to thank that team as well as other institutions who have been critical for 
moving this Kearns Enterprise forward here in Minnesota and beyond, like Greenland's Blue Waters, and of course the Land Institute, and Forever Green Initiative. I also want to thank our funders. We have received funding from state and federal agencies, as well as nonprofits and foundations. We are very grateful for that funding so that we can develop new sustainable cropping systems that enhance our environment and farmer well-being.